started to go over or we covered a little bit in the tissues unit, okay? So this is kind of reiterating the point of our three distinct types of muscle tissue, okay? You will be responsible for this as, again, on this lecture exam coming up. Remember, we've got our three primary types. Know the general characteristics, know which ones are voluntary and which ones are involuntary, and the main thing regarding cardiac was, remember, we discussed those intercalated discs, okay? We also talked about the general functional properties that we see in all muscle tissue. Contractibility, excitability, extensibility, and elasticity. Four general characteristics, functional properties that I wanted you to look over, okay? Moving on, we talked about some of the, gen now we're starting to get a little bit deeper into skeletal muscle. Okay, again, I'm just reviewing what we discussed on Monday. We talked about some of the general characteristics that we see with muscle tissue, our connective tissue coverings, okay? We had that three layering system, our epimyceum here, that outermost covering that is just below the fascia layer, okay? Then we have the perimyceum here, up here in this picture here you can kind of see here it's a kind of like a pinkish purplish color okay this is what's going to surround the fascicles the bundle of muscle fibers then we get even deeper we have the endomyceum here which is going to cover each individual muscle myofilament okay those muscle fibers right there okay we get even deeper so know this three layering system Okay, we went over that on Monday. Moving on. Then we talked about the organization of muscle fibers, going from largest to smallest. Make sure you understand this organization, going from largest whole muscle all the way down to our smallest myofilaments. Okay, and the myofilaments I'm referring to, I'm gonna go again, actin and myosin, two big ones. So let's move on. We talked about some more general um, structural components we see in the muscle fiber, histology. Moving on, remember I said to really highlight and notate the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It's that major, because again, remember, this will come into play. This is a high storage concentration of calcium, okay? This will come into play. You'll hear calcium when we start talking about muscle contraction. Moving on, now we're getting into the nitty gritty of how muscle contraction actually works, the mechanical aspect. Talking about the two myofilaments that are responsible for that. Myosin, the thick filaments, and actin, the thin filaments. We've already discussed on Monday the components and the makeup of each one of these myofilaments, okay? We talked about the sarcomere, which is the structural and functional unit of skeletal muscle. Please make sure you know, okay? In a relaxed muscle, the zones that are visible, and in a contracted muscle, the zones that are visible. Because remember, we're not changing the length of myosin and actin. We are only getting them closer together, okay? Moving on. I'm just kind of cruising over this because again, we've already done this on Monday. I really want to get, I broke down the steps in regards to muscle contraction. So we've got those three components we see in an actin filament. Actin, tropomyosin, troponin. We've went over those. Look over those again. You see the structure here. The two actin filaments that kind of form that double helical formation, okay? You've got that thin blue right here in the picture, the tropomyosin that is actually covering the actin binding sites until we have contraction that actually occurs. And here, the troponin, kind of a three, you can see here, a three subunit structure. 
or molecule that's on the actin filaments, okay? And you'll notice here, remember the big thing I wanted you to notate here in regards to troponin is it's got these calcium binding sites. Hmm. Remember we just mentioned the sarcoplasmic reticulum, calcium, right? A large storage area of calcium. So we've got these binding sites for calcium on troponin. Now we're gonna see how that comes into play. <clears throat> Again, we went over myosin, the makeup of myosin, myofilament, the big thing there. Kind of shaped like a golf club. This is gonna come into play when we start talking about cross bridge cycling, okay? The two big components or, or things we see in regards to myosin, okay? On the head structure here, okay, you kind of see its formation. It's got those two myosin heavy chains that, again, that kind of form that helical formation. Then you've got the hinge region right here, the hinge, okay, and kind of the golf club region up here that contains that ATPase enzyme, which is going to be important in order to break down ATP to be used as energy source, okay? Hi, James. Hello. All right. We kind of put a little side note there regarding those, those tightened filaments. This is what's going to give muscles that functional quality of elasticity. They're kind of located right way up there, those coiled structures. Those are tightened filaments. Those are what's going to give muscles the ability to be elastic. All right. Moving on. Now. We just started touching upon this on Monday. So we stopped off here. Let's just kind of, I'm just laying the foundation down so we get into actual muscle physiology, okay? So we have two main types of ion channels that I want you to notate. Number one, leak channels, okay? These allow slow leak of ions down their concentration gradient. These are always open, okay? Oh, right here. This is a picture right here. Okay, always open. Ions will move down their concentration gradient from high to low. Leak channels are always open. Okay, gated channels, on the other hand, either open or closed depending upon certain stimulus. Okay, in regards to we have ligand gated. We have ones that can mechanically be opened by some type of pressure or force, okay? And we have voltage gated, meaning they open based upon some type of electrical charge. <coughs> so again, the two main channels that I want you to understand. Leak channels are always open. Those ions will flow due to their concentration gradient from high to low, okay? Gated channels, on the other hand, open and close based upon certain stimulus, whether it's ligand, meaning some type of molecule attaches to them on their receptor, opening them, or mechanically gated, where they open based upon some type of mechanical force, and voltage gated, meaning they open based upon some type of electrical stimulus. Any questions on the type of gated or channels? Because we're gonna hear these terms again when we start talking about muscle contraction. Why is this so again gated and gated? Kind of seem like real similar. Which one, Jason? What? So the ligand gated, it look like it's... Well, there's your, no, actually, the ligand gated is, they're actually, there's some type of receptor there, and if, if whatever that receptor holds, and they're showing you a neurotransmitter, can open that gate. That sounds like yeah, and we'll see that with muscle contraction. These are ligands, so you see right here the receptors. Depending upon what type of molecule it needs to open a ligand, some type of substrate, some type of substance, molecule, okay, <clears throat> can basically open up these gates. And they're using the example of a neurotransmitter. We will see that with muscle contraction. 
So the voltage one, there's like an opposing force of both, a, instead of- An electrical force. stimulus. Right. Like an actual potential. See that in a lot in the heart muscle. And so mechanically it would be more of a, like a mechanical pressure. Pushing it open. You see that, Jason? Like I said, we will see this in muscle contraction. Neurotransmitter will attack, will attach in that receptor, that specific receptor, okay, opening that gate. You say Lyme gate is always open? No, no. The only one that's always open, leak channels. Oh, leak channels. Okay. Leak channels, always open. And these ions will move based upon their concentration gradient from high to low. Broke it down here for you a little bit more. Ligand gated just means that molecules need to bind to that specific receptor. An example that they give, like I said here, neurotransmitter will open that gate. Okay. Voltage gated, on the other hand, will open or close based upon small voltage electrical changes. Okay. Again, we're kind of laying the foundation down. If we understand this here, you'll understand it again when we get to the nervous system, okay? So let's first talk about resting membrane potential. When I'm talking about resting membrane potential, that means that an electrical stimulus has not been sent. We're, we'll just use the term, we're at rest, okay? The electrical charge difference across the cell membrane of an unstimulated cell. We have not sent that action potential yet. So in a resting membrane potential, however you need to remember this, remember it, okay? So the, now when I'm talking in respect to inside and outside the cell membrane, okay? So inside the cell membrane is negatively charged. Outside the cell membrane is positively charged. However you need to remember that. I always say I'm negative on the inside, positive on the outside. I know that sounds awful. That sounds depressing. That's really, that's truly not that's, it. That but if that, if that works for you, I use it. I'm always saying negative on the inside. That speaks to my life experience. Well, no, 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 no. That's... That sounds really depressing when I say I'm really negative on the inside. That sounds awful. But if, if that's what keeps it in my brain, honestly, okay? Negative on the inside, and again, we're referring to some type of cell, whether it's now or we're referring to muscle cells, muscle fibers, okay? They're technically cells, 
but they're fibers, they're elongated, okay? So inside the muscle fiber is negatively charged, at rest, at rest, at rest. Outside the membrane is positively charged, okay? Now this is due to, we have a concentration difference of ions. So the concentration of potassium is higher on the inside. This is where we're getting that charge difference. The concentration of sodium on the other hand is much higher on the outside. This is at rest. on this yet. We'll kind of piece it all together as we move forward. Right now we're at rest. This is an unstimulated muscle fiber. Okay? So in an unstimulated muscle fiber, remember the resting membrane potential. I am negative on the inside, positive on the outside. This is due to these concentration differences of potassium and sodium. Okay? So potassium is much higher on the inside and sodium is much higher on the outside at rest. Moving on. So now let's talk about action potentials. Again, I break this sequence down step by step, but right now kind of just laying it all out there first and then we'll go step by step with images, okay? So when an action potential is sent, what we're basically doing is reversing the charges of resting membrane potential. Remember we just talked about resting membrane potential, negative on the inside, positive on the outside. When an action potential is sent, we reverse those charges. The first portion, so then my inside is going to turn positive, my outside's gonna turn negative, okay? So, when it, so basically what an action potential is, is a rapid change across the cell membrane, okay? I just, again, this is kind of more of a little bit of an overview. We will go step by step. So when this electrical stimulation is sent, okay, we have certain gated channels that will open, allowing for those charges to reverse, okay? So I'm gonna start here with depolarization. My action potential was sent, okay? So I'm gonna flip-flop the charges. I become positive on the inside, negative on the outside. This is due to sodium gates opening, allowing that sodium to come in, okay? So again, we're reversing those charges, that's depolarization. This is just the overview. We will go step by step with an image so you see this in action. And sodium gate is the voltage gate, right? Yes. We're just talking in general right now. If we're stimulating a muscle cell, yes. We're opening up those sodium gates, sodium rushes in, changing those charges. I now become positive on the inside, negative on the outside. And this can happen in all three of the different number gated types or all four of the types? Uh, well, we always have, you'll see here, Jason, in a minute, we always have some leak channels always open at all times. Remember, they're always open. I'm talking more in the sense right now of voltage-gated channels that open in response to this electrical stimulus being sent. We will see ligand ch channels open as well in other senses of muscle contraction. So like kinky fibers or neurons of the central nervous system? Starting, 
that's yeah, that's our conduction system of the heart. That's a, we're that's a little bit further along than where we are right now. Just let's just cover in general right now. We're, this is more in respect right now, Jason. Right now, talking about skeletal muscle, our voluntary muscle contractions. Okay. So the other little side note I want to mention here is in regards to in order for an action potential to be generated, we've got to reach a threshold value, okay, in order for that action potential to be triggered. If it does not reach that threshold, we're not looking at exact numbers yet, not yet. I have a little graph here more towards the end, okay. If we do not reach that threshold number, the action potential dies. We, we don't generate it. We've got to reach that value in order for that action potential to be sent. Now let's move on. Let's briefly look at repolarization and then we'll go back again. I will break this down step by step with pictures so you see this in action. Okay? So near the end of depolarization, okay, depolarization just occurred, right? We are at resting membrane potential. I was negative on the inside, positive on the outside. An action potential was sent. I reverse the charges. I'm now positive on the inside due to the opening of certain gates. Okay, I'm now positive on the inside, negative on the outside. Now at the end of depolarization, okay, those gated potassium channels will now begin opening. My sodium channels close. Now, due to the opening of those potassium channels, so gated sodium channels close, gated potassium channels now open. I'm going to bring the cell back to resting membrane potential, repolarization. I'm now going to reverse the charges back, okay? Those potassium gates open, starting the repolarization of the cell membrane. I'm going back to resting membrane potential, okay? Now potassium is gonna exit. That outward motion of potassium is gonna reverse the charges back to negative on the inside, positive on the outside, okay? In a muscle fiber, when we are discussing action potentials, I'm referring to this is when muscle contraction is actually how it occurs. Isn't that, isn't that backwards? Isn't the repolarization, wouldn't that be the salt, the sodium leaving the cell? No. I thought the sodium was on the outside at rest. Yeah, and it rushes in and, from depolarization. And repolarization, it... It goes back to rest. So what we're going to do is we're going to close those sodium gates so sodium's no longer coming in, okay? We'll see it here step by step in a minute, and it'll make a little bit more sense. Okay. This is just kind of a, an overall picture right now. So you have that outward diffusion of potassium reversing the charges back. Sodium's not moving yet, but or staying still. But okay. we're just gonna change those charges back. My action potential dies. Okay, let's go step by step now. Mm. Let's go step by step. Let's go step by step. Now we're gonna see it visually as we discuss the steps. I gave you the overall picture. That to me was a little bit too confusing. Let's go step by step now. Resting membrane potential. You see right here, okay? These are the images that I got from your textbook, okay? So you see here, you have a much higher concentration, see right here, of potassium inside the cell, okay? On the outside, on the other hand, we have a much higher concentration of sodium, you see that? So here's my, here's my cell membrane. Here's my little, my little channels, okay? So you can even see, guys, some of them are leak channels. They're always open, okay? And you notice here the gated ones. 
Okay, they're gated. They're closed right now. An action potential is not being sent. Okay, again, I'm looking at a resting membrane potential. Potassium is much higher on the inside. Sodium is much higher on the outside. I've got a specific leak channel. Some of the leak channels are always open. That means these ions are moving, leaking based upon a concentration gradient, going from areas from high mm -hmm. to low. They're always open. Okay, that kind of keeps that, that kind of keeps that electrical charge or that electrical excitability factor, okay, always present on the cell membrane. Any questions? This is resting membrane potential. Okay. Negative on the inside right now. Positive on the outside. Okay. Rest. Why is it happy being at rest that way? Shouldn't they be equally charged for it to be wanting to be at rest? Well, we need that. We need that ion, that electrical difference across the cell membrane in order for it to be excitable. I realize that they're both positive ions, yes, but one of them, we, we more term in the sense of this side is more positive than the inside. It's not necessarily negative, it's just this is more positive than this side. We have a slight electrical difference across the cell membrane in order that allows for that elect electrical excitability factor. Okay. Moving on. So that's resting membrane potential. Now let's go to the depolarization step. Okay. Again, I broke down the steps. This is much easier to visualize when you see the steps broken down. Okay. Now depolarization. Now I'm going to have a change in charges. I'm going to reverse the charges. Remember rest, negative on the inside, positive on the outside. Okay, when, when that action potential is sent, this is along the cell membrane. Look here in the picture. My leak channels were always open. Now I'm opening when that action potential reaches threshold, we send it down the cell membrane, okay? My sodium gates, you see here, based upon that electrical stimulation, open. You see right here my sodium gates, the pink gates, open. My potassium gated channels are not open yet. When those sodium gates rush in, or excuse me, open, sodium rushes into the cell. That rushing in of sodium flips. The, the, the charges. That's depolarization. I flip the charges. Sodium gates open up. Sodium rushes in. Reversing the charges. I'm now, I'm now more positive on the inside than I am on the outside. Any questions yet? It's probably easier when I break it down like this than when I just gave the overview. I realized that was a little confusing. I like the step-by-step -step format. It seems to, seems to help the students because if you get potential questions on the lecture exam, it'll be something like put these steps in order. Yes, yes. Moving on to repolarization. So this is depolarization. Notice the sodium gates are open. They've opened. The gated channels are open. Sodium's rushing in. I reverse the charges. Repolarization. Notice here, my sodium gates close. Sodium stops moving in. Sodium stops moving in, okay? My potassium gated channels have now opened. <clears throat> My potassium's now going to start moving out of the cell. Okay?
my leak channels are always open. You can see right here, my leak channels stay open at all times, okay? But my potassium beta channel has now opened. Potassium's moving out of the cell. This is called repolarization. I'm going to go back to my resting membrane potential, okay? I'm changing back. I'm gonna become negative on the inside and more positive on the outside. I'm going back to resting membrane potential. What happens to the sodium that stays inside? We have some, um, it, it, it just stays there because you do have some leak channels as well. You have some leak channels even for sodium that are always open. Does that turn to like lactic acid? No. So it goes resting action potential. Uh, right, yeah, okay. Depolarization or Okay, so resting membrane potential, unstimulated cell. It's been stimulated with an action potential. I first go to, what's the first step? Yes, which is basically just what? Uh, the changing of the charge. Okay, charge, charge, charges alter, reverse, flip-flop. Then I go back to repolarization, and what do the charges do? They go back. Flip-flop back. Okay. I guess what I'm confused about is the sodium rushes in and then just stays and then the potassium leaves. Right, so then we're going back to, so, so then we're reversing back to I'm more negative on the inside and I'm back to more positive on the outside. But you've got more sodium inside than you do potassium. Right, but that's why we've got, we've got, those, we've got those leak channels too that you just don't see them here that are open at all times, we've got some of them that are allowing some of that sodium to move back out. Because technically it's like this. So yeah. the picture doesn't it, this, really is, this is yeah. a continued, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're just not showing at all. Emily, did you have? I'm, I'm confused on what you said because why would like the potassium, like if we have the sodium outside of the cell, that's why it's going to the potassium on the inside. Why would? Why is the potassium the leaving again? Out? Why would the potassium? Well, so again, you're, you're thinking of it that this is, um, I'm just trying to think how to easily explain it. Um, I'm just confused why it's not, I, I get that there are leakates, so there's always going to be some potassium and sodium leaving. But after this rush of sodium into the cell, mm -hmm. why is it then potassium gates opening to let potassium out of the cell instead of a change, instead of like, a, a well, change in direction for the gates for sodium to get the sodium back out of the cell? Right. Well, we want to reverse it back. Like I said, we've got a lot. So when you have that rushing in of sodium, right, you're going to have an a, a influx of, of positive charges now on the inside. Mm -hmm. We need to we need to flush some of that out. Okay, so and we're going to do that. You're right by by this movement. So it's just easier of to potassium. push the potassium out. Yeah. Okay. So if you're looking at the pictures, like number one has it negative inside the cell. Yeah. And, num and number two, it's positive inside the cell, and then number three is negative inside the cell. And Right, because we're going back to repolarization. We're going back to resting membrane potential. So resting membrane, the inside of the cell starts off as just negative out the gate. Say it again, Trina, I'm sorry. And resting membrane, I mean resting, the membrane is negative on the inside. Right. Okay. Yes. I would say you're looking at as complete charge differences. It's it's just like it's more like it, this is less positive than this side. So no, I I, I, un I understand difference. that. It's it's literally just the why is potassium leaving over sodium so because leaving. it was sodium that rushed in. Right. So why wouldn't it try and flush sodium out? That's literally the only thing I'm confused about. Um. Well, like I said, it, 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 it's gonna, with these leak channels that are always open, we're gonna have some movement. But it's, it, it's passive, whereas the right. gates are an active transfer, transportation, right? Because they're rushing it in? Well, not active, no. They're still, they're still moving against the concentration gradient. Mm -hmm. 
it just allows more. Well, it's moving against its concentration gradient. You know, sodium with, like I said, yeah, and it's based sure, sure. upon these channels. Opening and closing, but don't forget, like I said, you've got some of these leak channels that are always open. But if the equilibrium is that you have more at a resting state, you have more potassium inside, more sodium outside. Why? Resting state, yes. Why, when you go back to resting state, is it less? Why wouldn't you? I know why, what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my confusion. Well, I, it's probably outside of the scope of what we're trying to learn. I get that. It's just how I am. You're giving me flashbacks. <laughs> it's how I am. It's the tone of mass is doing the four page math problem. <laughs> well, don't don't be in my chemistry class with me either, because I get that answer. We're not going to cover that in this class Those are just all the time. Two prime movers. Those are the things that conduct charge in the body. Okay. Right. Those two. Those two atoms. They move electricity throughout the body. There's different. Well, levels. and like I said, I'm, I, you I'm know, not confused about that. I, I get that. Well, I get it, but we, like I said, and you're right. In the scope of, I hate to say that. I hate to use that term, but in the scope of this class. The other thing that is maintaining the resting membrane potential at all times is a sodium potassium pump. And that's, that is more of an active transport mechanism. Mm -hmm. That is also what is, not only this action, okay. but the sodium potassium pump is, you're right. Which always, is probably pushing out more sodium. Yes, always actively work, but, okay. but we're not getting that technical. Well. But yeah, you're right, you're right, I, I get it, I get it. But. It, that's always running as well. Okay. The active transport mechanism of the sodium potassium pump is also what's going to help keep the resting membrane potential going. That makes it a lot clearer, thank you. Propagation. Let me, does anyone have any questions again? I know, everyone's giving me that look like, well, how do we have, ask questions if we don't know what we're talking about? I get it, I get it. <laughs> Action potential propagation. I always like to use this in the sense of think about the wave when you're at a ball game. It goes in a, it's not the entire fiber that goes all at once. It's in a, a, a sequential pattern down the muscle fiber. Okay, it propagates. It's not the entire fiber that's going all at once. This action potential is sent in segments, okay? You can even see here, okay? This segment, as the action potential is moving its way down the muscle fiber, okay, we're reversing charges, okay? Then going back to resting membrane potential, okay? Does everyone understand here? Like I said, we're moving down in a, in a sequential pattern Okay, altering as that action potential makes its way down in a wave-like fashion. Okay, we see depolarization occur here. You see here the reversal of charges. Okay, going back to repolarization, going back to resting membrane potential on the back side. Okay, we're moving forward. Okay, propagate. Okay, moving in that sequential sequence pattern. Segment by segment by segment. Okay. junction. So now we're going to add in what we just learned in regards to action potentials, resting membrane potential, and how that correlates with the muscle fiber. So we have three primary components that makes up the neuromuscular junction. You have the motor neuron. This is the nerve you see right here. 
To me, I don't know, it look, doesn't it look like little froggy legs? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it kind of does to me. Like a tree frog? Yeah, it really honestly does. It does look like little, like little froggy legs, okay? That's the nerve cell, the, right here. Those little, those little axon terminals, those synaptic end bulbs, okay? That are going to actually stimulate the actual muscle fibers. Okay, the neuromuscular junction is basically, you see right here. This neuromuscular junction, okay? That's, that, that's the area, the components, where the neuron connects with the muscle fiber. Okay, here's the neuron. Here's the, here it is, here's my little tree frog legs, okay? That's the, that's the axon, here's the terminal here the synaptic end bulb right here that stimulates each individual muscle fiber. Let's get a close-up view of that right here, okay? This is a close-up view. There's, there's, there's the frog leg really close up, okay? That little froggy leg, super close up. We're just zooming in, okay, the neuromuscular junction. Now the synapse is that cell-to-cell -cell connection, that junction, that connection right there, okay? Now let's look at the actual components of a neuromuscular junction. Let's look at the components. Breaking this down. Don't get all nitty gritty on this, but you do need to know the components of a neuromuscular junction, okay? Keep moving this thing. You've got the presynaptic terminal right here. Okay, that's basically the end of the neuron cell of the axon fiber right here, the end. Okay, that's the presynaptic terminal. Your synaptic cleft right here is kind of that space in between the presynaptic terminal and the postsynaptic terminal. That space. Right here. Yeah, pre and post. Yep, pre and post. Now the postsynaptic membrane. Right here. They're showing you, they kind of have it highlighted in blue. Okay. <clears throat> Since we're talking about the neuromuscular junction, this postsynaptic membrane would be the membrane of the muscle fiber. Okay, the sarcolemma. <clears throat> Synaptic vesicles, right here you can see them, okay, inside the presynaptic terminal. These are what's going to store and release the neurotransmitter. Right here, the synaptic vesicles. We're just right now getting down the terminology and the components that we see in the neuromuscular junction. Synaptic vesicles, which are gonna contain a certain type of neurotransmitter, okay? And because we're discussing the muscular system, the main neurotransmitter that we want to notate is acetylcholine. Mm -hmm. This is the neurotransmitter that is responsible for stimulating skeletal muscle. So again, these are the components of the neuromuscular junction. Make sure you know the components and a brief description, okay? Synaptic transmission. We'll go through again, step by step. I have it laid out step by step again. But synaptic transmission, okay? Each muscle fiber is innervated 
by a branch of a neuron at the neuromuscular junction. Again, I'm just laying down the foundation. I'm laying down the foundation, okay? Now contact between the axon and the muscle fiber results in an action potential, stimulating the muscle fiber to contract. Acetylcholine, again, I want to emphasize that acetylcholine is the neuromuscular, or excuse me, the neurotransmitter responsible for stimulating muscle fibers. Now let's go step by step. Let's go step by step. So we've already talked about how an action potential is sent. Let's put it all together. Number one, an action potential right here, number one, is being sent down the axon of the neuron. Action potential. We already know how that generates. In a propagated wave-like fashion, that action potential is sent down the axon. Makes its way down to the terminal portion here, the presynaptic terminal. When that action potential makes its way down to the presynaptic terminal, calcium gates open, causing calcium to rush in. <clears throat> this influx of calcium causes the vesicles to make their way right here, you can see right here, by process of exocytosis, okay, makes their way to the, to the terminal end right here, releasing its contents, its neurotransmitter it contains, which is acetylcholine. So again, step by step, number one, that action potential makes its way down the axon terminal in a propagated fashion. We remember how that happens, depolarization, repolarization, depolarization, repolarization. Makes its way down to the synaptic end bulb here, the presynaptic terminal. That movement, that electrical stimulation causes calcium gates to open. Calcium rushes in. That calcium causes those, see those vesicles that contain that neurotransmitter to make its way to the end of the presynaptic terminal, releasing its contents by that process known as, we remember that from active transport, exocytosis. Okay, releasing that neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, into the synaptic cleft right here. Acetylcholine is released in the synaptic cleft. Is there a process where the calcium then leaves? Um, not that, not in our scope, no. All right. <laughs> Fair enough. Mm -hmm. We're not gonna cover that. I just want to know hey, how it works. Well, I get it. I get it. <laughs> We're not getting into all that biochemistry here, Michael. Let's see. So I watch like Marvel Marvels and how things work. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Okay. That's three steps. Moving on. Now the acetylcholine, step number four. Diffuses, makes its way across the synaptic cleft. Here's a ligand channel. Here's a ligand channel. It attaches to a ligand-gated channel. It needs that neurotransmitter in order to open. 
That's a sodium ligand. So when that neurotransmitter makes its way and attaches to that receptor, okay, it opens the ligand sodium gated channels. Sodium now rushes in. Huh. What happens when we have an influx of sodium? What do we have happen? Depolarization, yes, good. So when that sodium rushes in, we have depolarization. Now we've basically just transferred that action potential along the muscle fiber. So we sent that action potential from the neuron, just basically just by the movement of that acetylcholine attaching to that ligand gated sodium channel, opening those channels, we have an influx of sodium. That influx of sodium causes that depolarization action to occur. So we've now just transferred that action potential to our muscle fiber. Okay? Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, okay, it's, Jason, it's yes? Simple. So, is this similar to where diffusion, oh say like use sodium chloride and 0.9? If are we comparing the percentage of sodium on the inside to itself on the outside? Like if there's more potassium on the, on the inside now, does that mean that there's less sodium on the inside too, or is that completely separate? From yeah, I don't. I'm, I guess I'm a little confused as to what you're asking. That's just the diffusion gradient. Yeah, that's all that is. So, which which is what causes the sodium from the outside to go to the inside because there's less of it there and it wants to be equal. It's just the diffusion gradient. So when you have more potassium, you're, you just, on the inside of the cell, you're automatically gonna have less sodium on the inside of the cell. Well, it's, it's like we were doing earlier, because it's passive transfusion or passive transport, right? You got more sodium on the outside, more potassium on the inside. When the potassium gate opens, the sodium that's on the outside wants to make, it, make its way inside. But the gate's not open for the potassium to go out yet, except for the open ones that are just naturally there. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, yeah. they're one way. We're altering the charge yeah. difference. We're just now, and they are both positive ions. Yes, I understand that. But now we've just altered the charge difference. So now we are basically more positive now on the inside and we're more negative on the outside. <laughs> There's, like I said, we're just talking a slight difference here. Okay? Again, so that sodium rushes in, changing. Now we've started depolarization along the muscle fiber. Step number six. Now this is what happened, that we're kind of going back over to see what, hap what happens to this acetylcholine, okay, in the synaptic cleft. So we need, a, we need a way to break it down. We have this enzyme known as acetylcholase terase, okay, <laughs> that's a long word, okay, that's attached to the postsynaptic membrane. that's going to remove the acetylcholine from the synaptic cleft. We need a way to break that down because if we do not break that down, we will have constant muscle contraction, constant muscle stimulation. We can't have that. One interesting little thing, um, just a little side note, this is a little FYI, um, caffeine works this way. It is a temporary, I know, you're like, it's a temporary acetylcholinase, that enzyme, it inhibits that enzyme from, act or from destroying acetylcholine. So that's why caffeine gives us that little jolt, that, that stimulation. It is a, but it's reversible. It's a reversible stimulation. It inhibits acetylcholinase, that enzyme. That's why we get that constant muscle contraction, that stimulation when we drink caffeine. Nerve gases, on the other hand, they're toxic. They inhibit that enzyme permanently. 
it's non-reversible, that reaction, okay? And that was just a little side note, okay? So acetylcholine ACE, okay, that enzyme will break down that acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft. We need that broken down because we can't have constant muscle stimulation, okay? So once that acetylcholine is broken down, it can be recycled. It's broken down into acetic acid and choline. Some portions of that can be reused and remake acetylcholine where it's then stored again in the vesicles. Moving on to the next steps. Step number eight and nine. This is what happens to the actual recycling of acetylcholine. The choline is symported. When I say symported, it means it's transported in conjunction with sodium into the presynaptic terminal. Okay, where it is then recycled again to produce acetylcholine again. We're then basically just packaging acetylcholine again so it can be re-stimulated and basically let go again so we can have another stimulation, okay? So again, we have that enzyme, acetylcholine ACE, that will break down that acetylcholine that's located in the synaptic cleft, breaking down it to its constituent components, okay? Choline will be symported, meaning transferred together with sodium back into the presynaptic terminal, and it's recycled to make new acetylcholine, okay? Where it's then repackaged in, the synapt in these presynaptic vesicles, Again, before I start matching this with um, excitation, contraction, coupling, let's review. I shouldn't even put this up there because <laughs> I should have you guys do it from the top. So we're looking specifically now at the neuromuscular junction. Okay, help me out here. Step number, oh, I shouldn't even put this up here. I need to get to a basic picture. Let me get to the last one, okay? Can't, that way you can only, you only know these steps. Step number one, what happens? Step number one. The actin potential is sent down the axon. Don't read. <laughs> don't read. Don't read. All right, don't read. Action potential is what? Yeah, I'm not reading. Okay. <laughs> Not at all. I just got no. my notebook right in front of me. Yeah. Okay. Action potential. Let's send down the okay. axons. Uh, I should, you know, I should use the proper terminology. Propagated. Propagated. <laughs> You're talking about plants. <laughs> you can't, this chalkboard is terrible. It's got so much writing on it. Propagated down. Axon. Right? It makes its way down to the presynaptic terminal. Presynaptic terminal, right here. Okay? Remember your three components presynaptic terminal, synaptic cleft, postsynaptic terminal. Okay. Okay? That's step number one. Action potential is generated, propagated down the axon to the presynaptic terminal. Okay?
Because guys, you have to be able to put these steps in order when you see it on the lecture exam. Step number two. It's made it, now the actual potential has made its way down to the presynaptic terminal. What happens? Calcium yes. gates are opened. The actual potential causes calcium gates to open. Okay. Whoop. Calcium rushes in, right? Calcium rushes in, and what does that calcium do? What is that, once that calcium rushes in, what, is, what does that calcium cause? It does something in the vesicles and makes acetylcholine. It causes exocytosis of acetylcholine. Causes ex <laughs> I got like chalk on my face. So the calcium, right here, I should say two plus and not, I could have just do plus plus. The calcium, We'll keep it short. Calcium two plus, okay? Causes, I'm, I'm trying to keep it short, causes the synaptic vesicles that contain acetylcholine to make their way to the to the terminal portion here by process of what? And release, they release its substance by process of what? Exocytosis. Exocytosis. Releasing acetylcholine. Whoop, I, that should be another step. <laughs> I, I guess I could do, all right, I'll go on this side. All right, I'll go on this side. So now I've had release of, we'll just go from here. So I've now released acetylcholine ACH binds with the ligand. Well, okay, I'm going to say release. I kind of skipped a step. Released into synaptic cleft, okay? All right. So what's five? I'm sorry. What? Anyone besides Michael? Ruth. Guys in the back? Simone? Jada? What's next? Help us out. What goes? So my acetylcholine was just released in the synaptic cleft. What happens next? Jordan, anything? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Jaden, if acetylcholine it makes its way across the synaptic cleft, what does it do next? What does it do? It's Okay, and that, that acetylcholine, okay, good, Jada. Acetylcholine attaches to ligand gated sodium gates. Channels? Yeah, channels, gates. Causing what to happen? Sodium to, it causes the gates to open, right? Gates open. What happens to the sodium? Well, what happens? So once we open up those gates, what does sodium do? It comes in. It, comes in. it enters. When we see an influx of sodium, what do we have happen? Depolarization. Okay, sodium rushes in. Sodium rushes in, we have a reversal of charges, depolarization. So basically I just made a way for that action potential to now be transferred to a muscle fiber, okay, with the action of that acetylcholine, okay, that neurotransmitter. Now I have depolarization. Just, we'll, we'll go along the lines of now we're going to couple that with the actual mechanical aspect of muscle contraction. So I'm just going to move on here. What happens just briefly, guys, to that acetylcholine that's left behind in the synaptic cleft? Wait for acetylcholinase to come in its Okay. Acetylcholine A, so I'm going to keep it real short. 
ACE, I'm just gonna, I'm just kind of just keeping it short. That enzyme, okay, is gonna break down the acetylcholine that's left in the synaptic cleft. Breaks down acetylcholine. Oh, we got some acetylcholine, okay? And parts of that are recycled to produce new, more acetylcholine that's then put right back into the make, making those synaptic vesicles. Yes, Emily. Um, how does, does our, do our bodies just naturally produce acetylcholine? Yeah, it's a neurotransmitter. Okay. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I'm doing. Yeah. This this doesn't cover repolarization, does it? We'll get to that. Okay. We'll get to that. As we're set, because we're, we're just getting to the first stage. Moving on to the next stage. Now we're going to pair that. And of course, I'll write it all out when we're done then too. So now let's talk about excitation, contraction, coupling. This is where we're going to link what we just talked about. The electrical aspect of that extra potential being sent to the actual mechanical aspect of muscle contraction. We're going to couple that together. This is where those actin and myosin filaments come into play. Again, I'm going to break down and go step by step. Guys, um, I, I know that I tried to, I, I just got to move the test. I don't think I can. Um, please, today's Wednesday, correct? Okay. I will be here on Monday and we will finish up. We will finish up muscle unit on Monday. Um, I'm not sure what's happening for Wednesday, guys. You do know, remember that I won't be here Tuesday or Wednesday. So um, I don't know what's going to happen for Wednesday for you guys.